to YouTube. I see we have a bunch of people coming in. We have someone from the 760, um, 760 area code. We have Kristen, Lewis, Maurice, Pat, Sharon, Suzanne, Valerie, Tom, Joseph, George. Just a moment. Um, like okay. And in back of me is a uh, library, I think, from in Turkey uh, that I found a picture of. Uh, that's my background. All right. So tonight we are um, going to be talking about 10 unconventional weight loss tips. And uh, we will be going through all 10 of, well, actually we'll be going through nine of them because the 10th is actually gonna be the subject of next week's class uh, related to that. And I wanted to share one thing with you before we get started, just because someone shared with this with me right before uh, I came on to the class. And let me pull it up. Um, okay. So if you can see my screen, um, there's this article from Forbes that someone sent me. Now, most of you who have been on my classes know that my mantra, I guess you could say, is you have to become your own authority in health. And this was sent to me by someone uh, just recently uh, where there's an article here where the, the author says you must not quote, do your own research when it comes to science. I think uh, I understand where he's coming from, but the goal of, of this class, of course, is for you to become your own authority to be able to make your own decisions. This is uh, by an author by the name of Ethan Siegel. And he basically says, you really are not smart enough to make your own decisions. And the truth is that you really do need to have experts to rely on, but you need to be able to uh, learn enough to be able to make the final decision yourself. And we need to always be certain that we're not looking at authorities, experts that are put on the news as we shouldn't look for ones that sort of are looking to confirm the bias that we may have. It's very important for you to, to really look at both sides from a reason perspective. That's why uh, when it comes to just since we're talking about diets, it's very important to look at what the, what the hardcore vegans say and what the carnivore people say and what the paleo people say and try to get down to the basics and really try to see if there's any common ground. That's certainly one thing to look for, but also to really just have a, a clear understanding of, of where everyone is coming from and not just sort of go with what you think might feel right. But anyway, someone shared that with me uh, before the class and just sort of felt like I, I wanted to share that. Okay, so let's, um, let me share uh, a different screen here so we can get started. And let me know if you can see my screen, 10 unconventional weight loss tips. Let me know if that is there. And we will get started in just a second. Okay, okay, thank you, Caroline. And actually just, we, I'm always interested, I haven't actually asked recently, where are you calling in from? Uh, where are you watching? I'd love to hear some of the locations of people that are calling in. Um, and uh, Scottsdale, Suzanne's from Scottsdale, nice. Uh, Caroline's from Kiowa, South Carolina. Kristen's in Rochester. And we have uh, a bunch of other people here. Florida, ah, <laughs> hi, Irene. Uh, we've got Pat uh, from South Padre Island. Hello, Pat. All right, so let's get started. So we have 10 um, unconventional weight loss tips, and we're gonna go through, as I said, nine of them. The 10th is going to be reserved for, for next week where we'll be spending the entire hour, 45 minutes thereabouts. So let's get started. So the first one is understanding and managing insulin. And this one is going to be very important for everyone um, because it's the most misunderstood one that, that, that I think we're going to be discussing today. So why is it that insulin is such a problem? Now, we all have sort of heard about insulin because we've all heard about diabetes and how you know people who are diabetic often need to take insulin. Insulin is, has many functions. It, it, one, of course, is to shuttle glucose, blood sugar into the cell, but it's also a growth factor. And in addition to that, if the insulin levels are high, 
what happens is it inhibits something called lipoprotein. Um, um, oh, it inhibits lipase, which basically um, breaks down fat. So if your insulin levels are high, you're actually not able to physically break down fat. And if you don't get sort of an understanding of insulin, you're really not gonna get anywhere when it comes to weight loss. And a lot of people are a little confused as to what raises insulin levels. And a lot of people are actually pretty confused about that and are actually pretty surprised when they learn uh, what, what that is. So obviously we know that uh, sugar and starch, which, is, which we'll be talking a little bit more about amylopectin A in one of our other um, tips, basically starch, sugar, but also animal protein. So we think to ourselves, most of us don't realize that when you increase animal protein, there is a corresponding increase in insulin. The same thing does not happen with fat. So when we have increased levels of animal protein, you're going to get this situation where your insulin levels are high and you're not able to break down fat. That's essentially what, what it comes down to. So amylopectin A is basically the starch in wheat. And as I said, we're, we're gonna get into that in a little bit more depth uh, in another tip. Sugar, obviously, which we learned and a lot about last week, we spent an entire hour speaking about sugar and understanding the difference between fructose and glucose. And that class is on YouTube. So you can always go to my YouTube channel and view that. And pretty much everyone who watches that, it's a clear understanding of what sugars are safe, what sugars are fat or are bad, and essentially how to choose them properly and how to understand them. So that's important. So if you weren't here last week, definitely go to my YouTube channel and watch that class. So the next of course is animal protein. So I wrote here from, from an article that protein ingestion increases circulating, circulating insulin but in people who are obese with type two diabetes and just obese people in general, the insulin secretion is to protein is greater than in subjects with, without diabetes. Additionally, um, different proteins have a different impact when it comes to raising, raising insulin levels. So whey and casein in studies actually raised insulin levels higher than bread, if you can believe that. Uh, fish is probably, one of, so whey and casein, of course, are, are dairy proteins. So dairy is not going to be a good thing. So we're talking about cheese, that is going to raise your insulin levels quite a bit. And we learned last week as well that, that um, dairy proteins also have something in them called casomorphones, which actually activate the, the opioid receptors in your brain, which is going to make it difficult for you to actually stop cheese. So there's lots of reasons to think about doing an elimination diet when it comes to uh, cheese, to, to dairy, but we'll get into how to reduce amylopectin A as one of, the, uh, one of the other tips that we'll get into very shortly. So once you understand that, you start to understand why people who go on what are called whole food, plant-based diets, which is a, a, a type of vegan diet that is basically um, very, there's one, basically it's an oil-free high vegetable diet essentially. And so for those people, they're not eating any animal protein and they usually are avoiding large amounts of, of amylopectin A, of, of that type of starch. They're, e they're eating other amylopectins. Again, you'll understand this completely uh, in just a moment those type of people, they tend to lose an enormous amount of weight. In fact, when I think about my patients over the years, people who had the most response, and I'm not necessarily recommending this, I'm just giving you my anecdotal information, people who adopted something called a nutritarian diet, which is uh, essentially almost a completely vegan diet uh, with no oil, uh, but it's basically beans, greens, nuts, seeds, that sort of thing. Uh, they had the most consistent and dependable weight loss of, of really of really any patient I've ever had. They also have had, and again, this is just my my experience, the most amount of disease reversals as well. And this was popularized by a physician by the name of Joel Furman, who came up with that nutritarian diet. But um, one of the reasons, no doubt, is that when people are on that type of diet, their insulin levels are very very low, and insulin when insulin gets very very high 
because it's a growth factor, it's also been associated with an increased risk of cancer because it's a growth factor and you don't want everything growing. Uh, you, don't, you certainly don't wanna have a small tumor that in response or a microscopic tumor that in response to insulin turns into something significant. So that's another additional reason why it's really important to have this understanding of insulin. And I, I order insulin levels on people and we'll get into that a little bit later, basically on, on what types of blood tests could help you to sort of, especially if you're in a situation where you have gotten to a point where you think you've tried everything, you have this resistant weight loss, 10, maybe 10, 15 pounds, you just can't get it off. A lot of times uh, there's several blood tests that you can get that can give you a little bit of information that can give you enough information to be able to take that next step to be able to get rid of that extra extra weight that you're trying to get rid of. So let's close this down. And so how do we lower insulin? Well, obviously watching starch, specifically the, the amylopectin A, starch, watch that, watch sugar, watch abnormal amounts of animal protein. The fact is, is that when you look at longevity studies, you don't need all that much animal protein. In fact, it's probably maybe, you know, 20, 25 grams a day of animal protein is, 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 is essentially enough, especially if you're eating whole plant-based sources of vegetables and, and such that it's going to provide additional plant-based protein. And longevity study essentially show that you don't need all that much. In fact, longer life is associated with a decreased amount of animal protein. Once you get above 65, 70, however, there is increased protein demand. And it looks like you could actually start to increase protein as you get older and not have any negative kind of consequences. So maybe don't worry all too much about animal protein if you're in your 70s or 80s. But if you are trying to lose weight, which is the subject of this talk, we wanna be conscious of animal protein and really look at the fact that it's really not normal. It's, it's not really something that people should be eating at every meal of the day. That is a historically, essentially historic, if you look back in history, that's sort of almost perverse in the sense of when you look at how, pe how we evolved as, as humans, not to be able to be eating an animal every single meal is, is just really excessive. We, in our place of where we're at, especially in, in a rich society, rich societies tend to increase animal protein. It's almost, it's almost like a sign that your, your society is, is advancing. But unfortunately with that advance comes a lot of negative, significantly negative health consequences to eating enormous amounts of animal, essentially animal protein. So watch all the above, obviously consume calorie, less calories, uh, lowers insulin exercise, which we'll talk at essentially at which exercises in particular, we'll get into that shortly. A cinnamon one to two teaspoons per day, usually the studies uh, show can also lower insulin. Intermittent fasting, which we'll talk about also at a little bit more depth later. Soluble fiber intake also can help lower insulin. And you know, for the easiest thing for most people to do, is one to two tablespoons of flax seeds every day. That's the easiest way of increasing your fiber intake. Uh, having some inulin and eating some you know, beans and things like that also are gonna help. Green tea and visceral fat reduction, which is the, the fat around your abdomen. That, that is inflammatory fat. It's not just sitting there, it's actually releasing things that, that are going to affect obviously insulin, but also your risk for other types of things like metabolic disease and, and insulin resistance and um, increased triglycerides, a whole host of things. So that is number one. And really is number one because it encompasses so many different things when it comes to weight loss. Um, and that's why I chose it for number one. Next is avoiding wheat. Now I know that that is unpopular, however, like I was explaining just a minute ago, where I spoke about just my experience with people who are, you know, who have implemented various diets in my medical practice, the one, you know, if people just avoid wheat, it's a dependable five, sometimes 15 pound weight loss with strict avoidance of wheat. Now, I know a lot of us don't want to do that. And 
uh, I had, a, I believe, the fourth or fifth week of, of our classes, we spoke at length, you know, about, about in a, how to go forth and to try an elimination diet where you get rid of certain foods. And certainly we just spoke about dairy and how it is very beneficial for people to just, tr you're not going to have any negative consequences except for feelings of, believe it or not, withdrawal when you get off cheese. But if you get rid of cheese and wheat, you know, it's not like there's not a whole host of other things you can eat. And it is a absolutely dependable, really dependable five to 15 pound weight loss. I mean, I've literally seen 15 pounds disappear from people just by getting rid of, of wheat and, and usually grains. But even because when we speak about grains, most of the time we're talking about wheat. And the reason is there are three reasons. The first reason is something called gliadin. And gliadin is basically uh, essentially a part of gluten. And when we look, and we spoke a little bit about this last week, but essentially gluten hasn't actually changed. The amount of gluten hasn't actually changed in bread over the last hundred years. Uh, that's sort of a, a myth. But what has changed is the level of gliadin, the subtypes of, of this gluten. And gliadin is very, very damaging to the gut lining and can cause intestinal permeability, which basically means that, as we've discussed before, that you, know, you have just one cell essentially lining your gut. And when that is open, you're going to be getting things that are going to leak into your bloodstream that shouldn't be there. And when that happens, there's a whole host, there's a whole cascade of things that can happen. And that essential, essentially that intestinal permeability is associated with a whole host of things, including insulin resistance and metabolic damage, autoimmune disease, a whole host of things. And that's just gliadin. When you get that gliadin and you're eating that wheat, you're even if you are not getting an overt autoimmune disease, there is still some intestinal permeability most likely happening. And that, as I said, leads to a whole host of other things. Now, gliadin, when it's broken down, it can, it can form a peptide called, that it is an ex exorphin, which basically crosses the blood brain barrier. And like the, the casomorphone that we spoke about in dairy, binds to opioid opiate receptors, the pleasure centers. Now in this case, they don't actually create pleasure. What they do is they increase your appetite. And when you get off of, of gliadin completely and wheat, there is usually a, th I think it's a 300 or four, one of the studies showed 400 calorie just decrease in calorie consumption with, with no decrease in, you know, with no decrease in hunger or any sort of side effect, just natural intake decreases by three to 400 calories just by getting rid of wheat. So, and that's, keep in mind with people that aren't really changing their diet in any other way, they just naturally end up reducing the amount of calories that they're eating. And then the next thing that is essentially an issue is amylopectin, which we've, again, spoke about briefly. So let's talk about amylopectin. There's three amylopectins. There's amylopectin A, B, and C. Let's start with C. C, it's essentially the least digestible and it's in beans. So this, this is essentially for almost everybody not going to be a problem. In pe people are not going to be gaining weight from eating too many beans. That's not something that's gonna happen, generally speaking. Um, and uh, then there's amylopectin B. And this we see in things like bananas and potatoes. And this resists digestion to some degree and is also one that can be turned into resistant starch, a certain element of resistant starch that we spoke about in a prior class, which is where you can actually cook potato, a potato, refrigerate it, and you get, you know, various studies say different things, but you get somewhere between, you know, 2% to 7% of what's called resistant starch, which is really good for you. It's been shown to help diabetes and has, is is incredible. And we, there's, I have an entire lecture on my YouTube channel on, on the benefits of resistant starch. And then we have amylopectin A, and this is remarkably digestible. I mean, it raises sugar dramatically. And when we think about what's called the glycemic index, which is a measure of how fast your blood sugar rises, how, how responsive it is to, to something, 
uh, sorry, spelling mistake here. Um, we really get an understanding of what the dangers of amylopectin A is. Now, glucose is, which is our blood sugar, would be 100, of course. And, but the glyce, so the higher the number, the worse off. So the glycemic index of white bread is, is 69. Glycemic index of whole wheat bread is 72. Uh, shredded wheat, 67. And sucrose, which is table sugar, is 59. So table sugar is not going to raise your blood sugar as much as eating whole wheat bread. So please keep that in mind. And the reason is, is because of this amylopectin A. And we need to be conscious of that when we are, you know, we I'm essentially it's allowing you to understand what the situation is with wheat. Now, obviously, if you combine that with, you know, almond butter or something like that, it's going to lower the glycemic index, but that doesn't mean you're not getting the gliadin and the natural intake of excess calories as a result of eating wheat. So do I think that everyone needs to get rid of wheat? No, but if you have five or 10 pounds that you're trying, that you can't get rid of an elimination diet of wheat, just wheat, try, just, just try wheat for a month. I guarantee almost everybody is, tends to lose some, some amount of weight. Um, if you could do dairy and wheat for four to six weeks, I think one, you would realize that there may be some, there may be some things about wheat and dairy from a addictive point of view that, that are gone, but also there is some inflammation that happens with gliadin. And that can cause an inflammatory edema, even of the face. So sometimes you'll see people who they get off wheat and in a week, their face sort of looks healthier. It shrinks down a little bit. looks like they, they, you know, they've lost weight. They usually look better. People say, oh, did you go on vacation? Things like that can happen because the overall inflammatory effect of wheat can, um, can be reduced. Now there are heirloom varieties of wheat. We spoke about that actually a little bit last week. Um, that may not have the same damaging effects, but you know, the point is, is that these three things are essentially what's causing the problem in, in modern wheat. All right, let's move on to number three as, and by the way, if you have any questions, uh, let me know, just type them into the box. So number three is biological fasting, uh, fasting essentially. Fasting has actually, maybe not that unconventional anymore. I think last year it was a number one or number two most searched item was intermittent fasting. I'm gonna briefly go over these because we're already at 23 minutes and I, I wanna get through this uh, by around 45 minutes and really get to some of the more interesting ones below. But biological fasting is basically otherwise known as what's called a fasting mimicking diet, which is a five day period of reduced calorie intake that mimics the effects of a five day fast. And we have one of those at, at over at Miracle Noodle that we've formulated and um, it's five days of food. And again, the effects of biological fasting are reduction in, of insulin. You get uh, growth hormone release, something called autophagy, which is where you get recycling of the old parts of the cell. So your cells actually become younger. You have um, reduction in, in blood sugar, which affects your, you know, so you, certain elements of your, appetite and you're, you know, being triggered to eat things that are, that are sweet. So it, it has enormous benefits just by doing this five days a month. It's really a remarkable thing. Um, someone is asking a question, but I cannot see it because uh, if you could type it into the chat box, uh, please do that. Um, and then otherwise I'll, I'll take a look at that once I, I minimize the screen at the end of the lecture. And Pat is saying she can attest to that. Pat, I know, has done the biological fasting program probably four or five times now, and she doesn't do it for weight loss. She does it just to feel much better because you, you end up feeling younger. Your metabolism actually becomes more youthful. And she's saying she's done it seven times. Wow. That's more than I think I have. I think I've only done it around six or seven times. Um, and the fasting mimicking protocol that we have available over at Miracle Noodle, uh, using Miracle Noodle products is under, you can type, you can search Pareto plan, uh, P-A-R 
ETO. I'll type it in right here. And if you look at that, that comes with uh, some support as well. So that's over at, at miraclenoodle.com. We've had it and it makes it very, very easily. So uh, also obeying circadian biology, meaning really paying attention to many different things. We have a whole lecture we did on circadian biology. That's that I believe was three weeks ago. So go back to that and, and take a look at that lecture because uh, that one really contains some key insights in regards to, to sleep and just understanding how every organ in your body has some relationship to, to the clock. And when you don't obey that, you are setting yourself up for some problems. One night of poor sleep can affect insulin levels and blood sugar for 48 hours. And that could be, it could just be sleep, you know, that could be affecting things. Intermittent fasting is um, essentially where you do like a day fast or a one, one or two day fast. And then there's something called time-restricted feeding, time-restricted feeding, which is basically where you lengthen the, num the amount of time between your first meal and your last, your last meal and your first meal. And you wanna get it to around 13 hours. And um, that also has remarkable benefits as well. So even if you could start at 12 hours, you know, you finish dinner at, at seven and then you don't eat until 7 p.m. the next day, that would be beneficial. Do that for three to four weeks and, and see how it goes. And then maybe you can do 13 hours. So you're, you have dinner at seven and then you don't eat breakfast until, until 8 p.m. Try to, try to lengthen it a little bit more. And that also can reset your your metabolism in a very beneficial way, but you don't actually get the, the effect of biological fasting. In other words, getting that, that four, third, fourth, and fifth day of the biological fasting, you have incredibly profound changes that it makes me just smile because sometimes we don't even realize how good we can actually feel because we f maybe feel like we're doing fine and we feel good, but when you start embarking on a, pan, a plan of improving your health, every, you get to this point where you're like, oh, I didn't realize I could feel this good. And then you get to another point, you're like, wow, there's another level. And then when you, you become more sensitive to what's going on in your body, and when you become more sensitive to that, then just having that experience, you start to become more sensitive to things that are affecting this sort of delicate balance of your body. And when you get to that particular point in time, it becomes, you, you start honoring your, your body in a way that to me is almost holy. You start recognizing things about the, the miraculous nature of the bodies that we were given. And, and it, it can be a very profound journey <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when you really get into it. All right, let's keep moving on. All right, we're down to number four. So number four is divided into two categories. The first is nutrigenomics. And the second is something called personalized nutrition. Uh, and this was the title of the paper, Personalized Nutrition by Prediction of Glycemic Responses. I'll explain that in just a moment. When it comes to nutrigenomics, I've started to do that for my patients and I found it to be very valuable. And basically it's looking at various, what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are basically genetic markers that might be helpful in determining what may be the ideal diet that you're on. Now I'm gonna not go through all these, but these are some of the genes that we look at. And uh, if anyone's interested, I use, uh, well, you can actually go to a genetic, uh, type it here on the side, geneticninja.com. That's, <clears throat> that's, the, that's uh, that link will send you to the company that I use for my patients. Um, and if you are interested in me reviewing your, your results, feel free to reach out to me for sure. So here are some of the genes that, that we check. And this is just a very, very short sampling. But there's uh, APOA2 and PPAR alpha as an example. These the people who have these genes are more sensitive to saturated fat. And we have all kinds of people out there these days who are basically on one side of the spectrum saying that saturated fat is no good for you. I'm sorry, this, well, you have one side that's saying that it's no good for you. And then you have another side that's saying, oh, it's a myth. And you, know, you can eat all the saturated fats you want. And you, know, you end up thinking to yourself, I mean, what, what's the real situation here? 
Well, if you have these genes, you're more sensitive to saturated fat in the sense that you actually get higher blood glucose, higher insulin incidence of a fatty liver. You have an inability to receive satiety signals to, to fat, to saturated fat, which means that you can gain weight more than the normal person would with saturated fat. So there's a higher uh, rate of obesity as well associated with this gene if people are sedentary. So these people need to avoid saturated fat and usually benefit very, very much from that. Uh, next is a gene called FTO gene, which some people have labeled sort of like a, a fat gene because it affects ghrelin levels, uh, which is associated with your appetite and regulating the overall number of calories. So those people in this case may not be the perfect people to, to do intermittent fasting, in fact. And so this is one of those situations where when someone has that gene, maybe we counsel them in a different way. And just because you have the gene doesn't mean you can't do that. It's just something that you keep in your back of your mind towards the goal of optimizing things for yourself. Also obeying uh, sleep cycles for these people is important. And then we have, uh, we have this gene, which is the ANKK1 gene, which is associated with a lower dopamine receptors, which basically means that when you have lower dopamine receptors, you're looking for what's called like a dopamine surge, which is associated with pleasure. So that's why these people tend to be more responsive to wanting to eat higher carb, higher sugar foods to activate and get that pleasure sensation that comes from having a lower, lower dopamine receptor. Then we have uh, this, um, the gene that basically re regulates adiponectin, which is related to pe people who have low levels are essentially um, been found in people who are obese. And there are ways of increasing adiponectin. In this case, we intermittent fasting and reduction in uh, red meat, berries, chili peppers, turmeric, ginger, garlic. The point I'm trying to make, I don't wanna get too, too far into the weeds, is that there actually is a role for genes and looking at genes in optimizing your, your overall health. Does it mean you, you can't get there without doing this? Doesn't mean that at all. It just means that for people who are interested in getting, looking at it, may, maybe, you know, just another level beyond, this can, be, this can be helpful. I've done it for myself, it, it was helpful. And for members of my family, and of course, for, for those patients, sometimes it confirms things that you were thinking about. You know, as an example, I showed that I was, sensitive to caffeine. I sort of knew that already, but, but knowing when you, when you, when you get the knowledge here and it's actually been shown for in studies that when, when people see the genes that they have, that they might not be, that maybe they need to reduce their, their saturated fat. Most people become more compliant at that. They become better at following those, those guidelines. Um, I'm not going to go through the others, but uh, just because it gets too complicated and because you haven't, most of you probably haven't done that, it, you, there's not a whole lot of benefit, but nonetheless, it's available and something to think about. Next is personalized nutrition by prediction of glycemic responses, basically means personalizing your nutrition by understanding what happens to your blood sugar. And this was done by a really great uh, what's called, he was, his name is uh, Aaron Siegel from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And they came up with an algorithm that, and this is directly from their paper that integrates blood parameters. So dietary habits, anthropometrics, measurements of the body, physical activity, and gut microbiome that accurately predicts postprandial glycemic response, which basically means that they've taken all these different things and they put them together and they're able to predict what happens to your blood sugar in response to a certain food as a result of all these things. And the most remarkable thing about it is that the, you know, we spoke about glycemic index before, right? We spoke about it in terms of, you know, how whole wheat makes your, your glycemic index just go, you know, makes your blood sugar go up, your glycemic response high. The point is, is that that's, you know, an average of people that are studied. What's your, what's your individual response to, to whole wheat bread? It could be a lot less. In fact, some of the remarkable anecdotes for, from people from this particular uh, algorithm is that some people, like for example, had you know, ice cream and it didn't raise their, their glycemic response. 
Now, when your blood sugar isn't going crazy after, after a meal, that is, doesn't mean that it's healthy necessarily, but, it, but that increased spike it leads to a whole host of problems because when that spike happens, your body needs to mobilize an enormous number of, of hormones and such to, to lower that down. And so you are definitely, it's definitely healthier for you. There's less aging, there's less uh, insulin response, which we spoke about when you can find a food that isn't going to make your blood sugar go crazy. And this is, can accurately predict that by taking a survey and sending them a stool sample. They have a company called Day2 actually, um, that I haven't done it myself, but it is something that I've been meaning to do uh, just because I find it really, really interesting. And when it comes to weight loss, it could be that there's something that you're eating that may be elevating your blood sugar more than you, than you really think. And that could be playing a role. So, uh, so that's something to be conscious of. Okay, we're getting, uh, we're already half past the hour, so I need to speed up. And the rest, actually, I think we, we can speed up. So next is cold therapy. Believe it or not, cold therapy, which is becoming very popular now, you know, there's cryotherapy companies out there where you can go and get, and that can, you be, and that can help, believe it or not, with weight loss. And, and, and it also stimulates some other things related to anti-aging as well. But you essentially have brown, white fat, which is your stored fat, and you have brown fat, believe it or not, which is a very small amount, but it generates heat by using white fat, which basically means that you want brown fat. You want a little bit of brown fat. And how do you do that? How do you, get, how do you activate the brown fat and maybe even grow more? Cold showers and ice baths. <laughs> that might not be the most popular thing in the world, but believe it or not, there are plenty of what are called you know, body hackers out there that have and very wealthy people, I might add, who set up uh, tubs that are meant to, you know, be around 55 degrees. Um, I so that's not something I've ever done, but um, it has been shown to be to be helpful. And certainly, cryotherapy, which is available all over the place, at least in most major cities, is certainly something that you could add to the regimen as well. I think you, you know, I don't think it's all that expensive actually. Um, and again, it's pretty, pretty available out there. So, all right, let's move on to number six. Number six is get a lab evaluation. We've sort of already referred to this um, already because we've spoken about adiponectin, we've spoken about ghrelin, we've spoken about insulin. Um, and so let's take a look at two companies. One is the Life Extension Foundation, which I mentioned before, and they sell supplements that, that um, most of the supplements I take are from Life Extension Foundation. I don't have any association with them, but I've learned an enormous amount from, from them. And, um, and then there's Vibrant Health, which is a company that I use for personalized and advanced lab testing for, for my patients. Now, Vibrant Health has a, a, a test that is consists of these things. We'll talk about food sensitivity in just a moment. Uh, measures leptin. We've spoken about adiponectin already. Runs a hormone panel, micronutrients. Sometimes you can have a micronutrient deficiency that, that can affect your overall weight. Uh, insulin, we've spoken about at length. Hemoglobin A1C, which is related to the average blood glucose. Really, you know, one there was one doctor, I. I don't remember who it was, but basically said, you know, a glucometer uh, measuring your, your postprandial glucose, which again is what we spoke about just a second ago, is really potentially the number one most valuable thing that, that you could do to work on weight loss. Because when you really understand what's happening to your blood sugar and you get that under control, so many other things get better. Um, so, and then thyroid, of course. Now, um, and then there's Life Extension Foundation and they do something similar. They check sex hormones, uh, obviously all the thyroid, a little bit more comprehensive. Cortisol, which is a stress hormone and definitely related to, you know, if your cortisol is high, that's going to affect your, all your hormone sy systems because cortisol is gonna take, you know, if you have cortisol, it, you're essentially telling your body that it's an emer you're in an emergency state. Forget about reproduction. Forget about you know homeostasis, keeping things balanced. 
you are being chased by a lion and you just shut everything else down. You conserve calories, you know, maybe you're going, you're in such a panic that, you know, you in, you know, evolutionarily speaking that you need to store fat. So cortisol obviously is important. Insulin, um, ferritin, hemoglobin A1C, uh, lipid panel, CBC, vitamin D, and, and CRP, high sensitivity CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. And if you're inflamed, that's also something that is going to affect your weight loss. So this is something to consider uh, if you live in Florida or uh, California and, and you want me to order one of these tests for you, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, it can be difficult to order. However, Life Extension Foundation you can actually order this on your own. Uh, it costs around $250. You do not need a doctor anymore to get your own lab, lab tests. And I urge, I suggest, there's uh, any labs now company, uh, we have that in Florida, that you can just walk in and get labs. And I think that's great. Um, I think the, the guy who wrote that article that I went over in the beginning would probably think that that's terrible, but I actually think putting some of this in control of the patients is really a valuable thing. Uh, do you have a sense of how, Carolyn's asking, do you have a sense of how frequently you need to do cryo to get benefits? Most people are recommending um, just once a week of like a 55 degree or less bath for like 20, 20 minutes or so. I think it's really that long. I don't, I don't know how people can stay in there. Maybe it's not 20 minutes, that sounds excessive, but it's usually, um, it's usually once a week, and then they tend to do uh, a cold showers on, on a semi-regular basis. Also, I think 55 degrees is usually what, I'm not an expert in cold thermogenesis, but that's generally what I hear about when people are, are doing that. Uh, Pat is reminding me about Quest and LabCorp, and that's true. Quest, Quest actually does have an order your own lab program now which I believe they were forced to do because of several other private companies that, that sort of got into it. So I don't know, I'm not aware of LabCorp actually having that available. So thank you for those questions and clarifications. Uh, all right, moving right along because we're getting close to the end of the hour. Smart exercise. I want to spend a good amount of time on this because most of us are trapped in the 80s when it comes to exercise. I'm going to say this bluntly and directly. Uh, if you're going on a treadmill for 30 to 40 minutes a day, more than three or four times a week, you are damaging your heart. And that has been shown. And it's also not going to affect your, your weight loss. We, in, uh, again, all of us, a lot of us are trapped in the 80s because in the 80s, that's when aerobics was really popular and People actually did get, you know, it's better than nothing, obviously, in the beginning, but it's not going to lead to sustained weight loss. Uh, and we're going to get into, into that. What is the proper amount of exercise for you to, to lose weight? So the first thing is, is eliminating chronic cardio. If you are running and you are out of breath, then you shouldn't be doing that for more than 20 minutes. Longer than that, it has absolutely minimal effect unless you're training for a marathon. Marathon runners often show some, some damage to the heart muscle that's similar to what you would see almost in a heart attack, believe it or not. And really take a look at put a marathon runner next to a sprinter. Now, uh, honestly, sprinters are muscular. They have very low body fat and marathon runners are incredibly skinny, but actually they may not have all that much, they, their body fat percentage is usually much higher and they can actually, some of them can be actually what's called skinny fat. And the reason is, is because when you're doing chronic cardio and you're running for 40, 50 minutes, an hour every day, what's happening is, is your body, you know, it it's realizes what's going on and it wants to conserve, it, it, it wants to get rid of, you know, tissue essentially so that you're more efficient. And, in, and it's going to get rid of, you know, it's going to conserve a little bit of muscle, but it's going to get rid of muscle and muscle uses fat. So if you're going on these long-term 
amounts of running, it's going to rely on fat, which means that your body is going to adapt by saying, I need a little extra fat to supply my muscles for this long-term duration exercise. That's not what you want. So you need to eliminate chronic cardio. And, and the reason I put the sprinter versus marathon runner, just put them up next to each other. Not that sexiness is any sort of, uh, you know, gauge of, it, of anything necessarily, because that can be influenced by, by cultural things, but who looks healthier? I mean, a sprinter looks so much healthier than a marathon runner. And that's what we're going, that's what we're going for because they actually are a lot healthier. Uh, pay attention to the said principle, which is specific adaptation to impose demands. And which basically means your body adapts to what it's being exposed to, which means that you need to, ver to vary things up and challenge your body as much as possible because even sitting down has its demands. It, in other words, you can look at people and you can, you can almost see from their body habitus what they are doing on a regular basis because their body is adapting to that. It could be posture, it could be muscle size, muscle tone, all of these things are a specific response and adaptation to the amount of activity that you have. Uh, let me get back into how to design your plan in just a moment so that we can understand really the best summary that I've come across. And that's from Mark Sisson, who was a uh, endurance athlete for, for a long period of time. He's also uh, started a company called Primal Foods uh, and had a very pop, still has a very popular website called Mark's Daily Apple and was actually very much responsible behind the paleo movement. But what I really like about him is that he sort of summarized exercise in such a really remarkable way in three different ways. And I would probably add one thing to this, but um, one is move at a slow pace, which basically means that you should be moving and walking as much as you possibly can. You should be able to, if you are just starting out, work up to being able to walk for one consistent hour. That can be very challenging for people who haven't been exercising. So start out with that. Next is to incorporate some sort of lift. So move, lift, um, move, lift, and it's not move, lift, and lift. It's move, lift, and sprint. So lift, obviously, any sort of resistance training. Uh, Sorry, this this is <laughs> this is sprint, and this is lift. So less frequently at a slight slightly faster pace. Now that doesn't mean you might not be able to sprint all out sprint. That doesn't mean it just means that you need to move faster to get to a point where you're out of breath, but only do that for a very short period of time. So that could be a 20 minute workout where you have four or five periods of just 30 seconds of moving faster, getting your, getting out of breath and then re relaxing and then doing it again. Uh, you can look up all kinds of different strategies for that. But the point is, is that you want to walk a lot, maybe twice a week, you spend an hour walking, tw maybe twice a week, you sprint or, you know, get on the treadmill and go up a little bit faster. It could just be a walk and then calm down, then let it calm down and then lift doing some sort of resistance training that could be body work, body exercise, but getting all three of these things is going to be the most helpful for you. And also when it comes to, to weight loss. So how do you design your plan? This is from Ben Greenfield, who is a uh, personal trainer and body hacker, I guess you could say. Um, and has a, has a very interesting podcast. Uh, he says, combine exercises. Uh, and sometimes instead of doing active rest period, instead of doing rest periods between sets, you know, do something that's active. Um, go outside, change the center of gravity. So work on different types of exercise for the same muscle. Work out a different time per day. The, the point is, is that you don't want to adapt at all to the, this sort of idea of specific adaptation of imposed demands. And he says, when in doubt, follow this rule. Don't go for more than four weeks without significantly changing a specific staple of your exercise program. You really need to change it up. And I'm in a big fan of just trying every once in a while, switching it up and trying a video, a YouTube video that is a resistance training or program 
they have so many of them. Some of them are 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Just try different things and see how it goes and then change it up as much as you possibly can. That's really the best way to go about it. Just eliminate this chronic cardio. You're not gonna get anywhere by biking for 40 minutes a day, honestly. You're just gonna to adapt to it and at some point it's just not gonna do anything for you. You gotta incorporate all of these things and make sure you incorporate some flexibility as you're doing, doing all of this. That one is so important because we, most of us really don't have a clear understanding of what's going on there. Just because we think we know, but we, we don't really know. Then there's assessing stress. Of course, it's really not on that unconventional, I guess you could say. But we have to understand, and I always say this, that all of us need 20 to 30 minutes of downtime during the day of relaxation. Most of us, it's not uncommon for me to ask my patients what your stress level is. And I think I'm actually gonna stop that because a lot of people don't think they're stressed, but if you were to measure their stress in some way, whether that would be through something called heart rate variability or through hormones like cortisol, a lot of people, they're just, you know, especially mothers, they like starting in the beginning of the day, they go through the entire day. They might not feel the physical demand necessarily. They, they feel challenged all day. They, and you know, they're satisfied but the amount of stress, the normality of that is not necessarily, it's not normal because they're, they're in a, a state of overdrive the entire day. And even though you might not have the feeling of stress necessarily, chances are that we all have stress. And the, the, the question is, is how much stress do we have? And that's why just as a minimum, everyone needs 20 to 30 minutes a day of downtime, active downtime. That, that means internally directed relaxation. That's prayer. That's taking a bath and, and taking deep breaths. Meditation, Qigong, Tai Chi, something internally directed. It could be reading an inspirational or spiritual book that, that, that you know, those sorts of books that you actually feel it within your body as you're, you're sort of engaging yourself with the book. That's... That's what I'm talking about. But I wanted to raise the, the issue of heart rate variability, which is a measure of the naturally occurring beat to beat changes in heart rate and rhythms. And this is a way of assessing your, your stress. There is less variety, less uh, variability when you are stressed. And there are various ways of measuring this. Um, people have these aura rings or these things, I forget the name of the, the company, but you can wrap it around your chest and it can, uh, it's almost like an EKG in the sense that it allow, allows you to be able to see this beat to beat change. And as a real, as, as what, as the HeartMath Institute, which we'll talk about in just a moment, they basically say that it's a key indicator of physiological resilience and behavioral flexibility and can reflect an ability to adapt effectively to stress and environmental demands. And people who are, you know, as I mentioned, uh, body hackers who are trying to, you know, hack their body often will check their heart rate variability in the morning. And if it's not good, then they'll, they'll not exercise as intensely as they normally would because they're able to see that they're, they're not as resilient that day as, as maybe the day before. And there's an organization called HeartMath Institute and they really are remarkable in the sense that they've been able to study how the heart actually has an intelligence of its own. Now, we've spoken about gut intelligence, how because there's so many nerves around the gut that there's actually signals that, that are communicating to the brain. The heart has similar amount of, you know, it has all these nerves around it, and, and it, it's capable of detecting, amazingly, detecting rhythms and electrical signals from, from outside itself. It's pretty remarkable actually. And it can communicate from, the heart can communicate to the brain in a way that is very, very unique. And I urge all of you to check out Heart Math Institute. It's a very strange name and they have a heart rate variability training there. But I would recommend that you read one of the books related to, to stress, or there's actually several books related to various issues like anger, um, anxiety, uh, I, I can't remember all of them, but I would recommend that you read one of those books to understand the intelligence of the heart and how that relates to stress and heart rate variability because 
it opens up an entire new perspective on, on your body. And we all know, as we're getting close to the end of the lecture, we all know that the heart has always been known throughout all cultures as, you know, the center of, you know, the seat of the soul, perhaps, or the center of, of love and emotion and such. And when you start understanding how the heart actually functions in these ways, you really start to see the, the intelligence that we had, you know, cultures had re revolving around what, what the heart represents from a, now from a scientific perspective. Number nine is allergies and sensitivities. There's no question that when you, that when you have a sensitivity to, there's different things. There's, there's allergies and then there's sensitivities. Allergies is where your body creates an allergic response to a food. Whereas sensitivity is where you're, you're, you're actually developing antibodies. These are IgG and IgA, but it's not an overt allergy. So nowadays we can check for IgG and IgA. Uh, IgE is the one that you normally get when you go to your doctor and he gets an allergy test. That's IgE. But nowadays we can get IgA and IgG. Allergists are not too fond of these tests, um, but we're not looking for allergies. We're looking to see if you're sensitive to any foods. Is your body making any sort of response? Now it doesn't mean that if you have a positive allergy or I'm sorry, a positive sensitivity, that that's automatically related to the fact that you're going to have uh, weight, weight gain from that. But it just gives you, just like the nutrigenomics, gives you additional information about ideas to tackle when it comes to trying to get to a point where you're, you wanna lose, lose some extra weight. And also it increases what, what I spoke about before with the gliadin, it, it increases you, for in some people, when they have a sensitivity, the intestinal permeability, which can affect so many other things. And that, my friends, is, uh, is what I wanted to discuss. Um, next week, we're going to be discussing environmental health or toxin exposure, but I like to call it environmental health because our environment is becoming more toxic by the day. And there are people out there who are more sensitive to environmental toxins. That's just the truth of the matter. Maybe you're not one of them, but maybe you are. And if you don't get a clear understanding of that, again, we're, all of these things are to try to learn more about your body as much as possible. Next week, we'll be discussing these topics. Uh, foods to improve your liver function, plastics and how they can affect your hormones, uh, toxins and metabolic syndrome, which we spoke about quite a bit tonight in terms of insulin resistance and uh, abdominal fat and cholesterol and such, you know, the role of sleep in detoxification and how to, how to do safe cooking. Uh, there's very popular ways of cooking that actually increase the toxins. So how do we do safe cooking? So that's what we'll be talking about next week. And that will be more than enough to go through, uh, believe it or not. There's so much stuff to talk about improving liver function and understanding and avoiding plastics how metabolic syndrome is affected in sleep. It's really quite interesting. So thank you all for your attention. I see that all of you have stayed here. I really appreciate your attention. I wanted to thank all of you, uh, just some of you uh, from this one from the 760 area code 916, Carolyn, George, John, Joseph, uh, I guess, Irene, Joy, Lewis, Maurice, um, Pat, Ryan, Sharon, Sheila, Suzanne, and, and several others. Thank you so much. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the hour, and I have a class of my own that I attend uh, at nine o'clock, so I have to go. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, again, greatly appreciate it, uh, your attendance, and I look forward to seeing you next week where we talk about environmental health. Uh, thank you again, and thanks again for your questions. Uh, I wish everyone a good night and good health. Bye-bye.